P-R-I. This is our date re- date night right now because we're we're still not really going anywhere other than takeout um, and occasionally the grocery store. So this is this is our shot for a date night, and we love it. Hey, well, we're calling in from uh, Washington D.C. So thank you so much for welcoming us into your uh, community. This is our first class, and uh, we love cooking. One of the things that we miss the most is you know going to a restaurant and not knowing what something's going to taste like. So we're uh, we're replicating that experience here with you all. So thanks for coming. This is our third class, and um, we really enjoy having these as our date nights as well. And we're thankful to uh, be healthy and our family be healthy, and to have something fun like this to do on the weekends. I am so happy that the the chef's garden is no longer Jacksonville's best kept secret. Do you want to be proud of your next dinner party? Do you want to learn how to create a thriving business feeding an entire city? Or do you just want to impress your next date? Get ready to upgrade your culinary game with Liz and Jen Ernest from Chef's Garden on this episode of Beyond the Bold. Chef's Garden is a locally owned catering company specializing in serious high-end food for any occasion. They recently began offering virtual cooking classes with at-home meal delivery, a service that's exploded in popularity in recent weeks. Think of it more as a virtual dinner party where the chef lets you in on his secrets. We sat down with Liz and Jen to get the full story on creating their thriving family business and get an inside look into the catering world. Tell us about Chef's Garden. How, how do you explain it, what you do when you talk uh, to people, when people say what you do? What do you say? Well, we say we're an off-premise catering company that aids people in planning, design, and whatever their needs are, we can point them in the right direction so that they don't have to go to 50 million places. Like if they need something from a design company, we can send them there. Um, They don't have to search those places out. When did you start this? I started this company um, in August, um, right before 9-11. So 2001, right? Well, there's an awesome time to start. (laughs) And, you know, it was it it, it really started out where Jennifer had gone away to school, and I always told her I was going to go to work when she went to college. And so I searched out for a year what I wanted to do, and I was really just led into this catering experience. Were you just an awesome cook? I was a great entertainer. I don't know. I I was a great entertainer. I've always had professional people in the kitchen since I started. How did you gravitate? How so? Just because you loved being in the kitchen? I loved having people around and hosting them and watching them have a good time. So I thought at first I was going to be a wedding planner, and then I met a man that said, "I've got a catering." company building for sale. Yeah. Let me show it to you. When I walked out, I was renting it, not knowing really what I was going to do. And three months later, bought it because business picked up really before um, we ever thought it would. Then 9-11 came along and everybody's business flatlined. Yeah, but you said you started in August and then here it is, uh, September 11th. I mean, you weren't even in business a month when this all happened. I know. But we started out doing a lot of medical reps, and so we were doing 10 and 15 deliveries a day. So for somebody who had just started out, that was great. We had nothing to compare it to, so everything we did was was a plus. How did you get your first client? Well, my mother was in the hospital, and I went to, to visit her, and a oxygen rep was in there and I told her what we were doing and she hired us and she sent our name everywhere and then we used to wrap our food up like presents when we would go to deliver to the office buildings and we would have people actually chase us down for our cards so we did mostly lunch deliveries and a few nighttime events and then moved gradually more into the social catering how how did you create 
when, when you made that first, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing it like a, a very fancy box lunch, okay? So how did you decide what that's going to be? I mean, is it like ham sandwiches? Just that you just And you just sort of just well, decided which one to put in there, and you just made several different like versions of chicken salad and stuff and figure out which one you're going to say is you? Before I started, I teamed up with a caterer in Gainesville, and he helped me develop the menus and everything that we needed to get going. The recipes and all the, the recipes, and I hired a professional chef and kitchen staff, and so we had a wide variety of what what we did, and a lot of those were sandwiches, cold lunches, hot lunches, and we would the cold lunches we would wrap up and tie with a bow and deliver them, so that just created a little bit of buzz and attention. Why is Chef's Garden? That was the name that um, of the company that I teamed up with. But we didn't partner, yeah. and I bought that name from him. So you weren't – see, I would have thought that you would have been the chef and you would have evolved into the business side. But what, what you did is that you loved the hospitality side, and then you brought in – and obviously interviewed to get the chef so that you could be the hospitality business person that was doing that. Exactly. And I was in the kitchen at first. Everybody was in the kitchen. Everybody wore every hat at the beginning. So we would, I would be back there helping prepare the food. Then when it was time to deliver, I would go on the delivery. So did a little bit of everything. So I, why when Jen went away to college, when you said, I want to, was it just you saying that, well, I, I'm going to have some extra time, and so I want to just sort of... Were you really thinking it was going to be what it's going to turn into, or were you hoping for that, or were you just looking for something to do a little bit? No, she was my only child, and yeah. everybody thought I would fall apart when she went away to school because we were very close. <laughs> and so I was looking for something to do, and I remember like almost probably 18 to 20 years ago saying, you know, Randy, I really don't have to work. This is just um, to keep me busy and occupied. Well, boy, did I eat those words. Because so, so, but that was the plan at the time you started it. You just wanted to dabble in some other things. Right. And it took off, and especially when Jennifer came on board, she, you know, obviously has helped immensely with the growth. And But you, you existed as a company while she was gone, so you were gone for a while. Um, uh, she had the company for four, four or four and a half years before I came back. So um, what was it like? Now I'm speeding up four and a half years later. So were you, how, I assume y'all are still very close, talking a tremendous amount of time. So you're seeing some of the, where did you go? So I went to University of Miami um, in South Florida. Okay. And my mom actually connected me with a company that is still like one of our like pinnacle companies that we would, uh, is our goal to grow to be um, or an aspiration for us, the uh, Joy Wallace Catering and Events or a Joy Wallace Event Productions mm -hmm. in Miami. So she... Put me in touch. I worked a couple of events with them. and talk, While you were in college down there. Mm -hmm. okay. And talk about karma because they did these super cool events. And I was one of a staff probably of like 50, 75 servers, maybe more that they called. And um, I was the college student that would be like, hey, actually, I know I'm supposed to work tonight, but I've had something come up. So <laughs> they always are very gracious, but it's like one of those like learned lessons. Um, and so then I came back for what was just supposed to be a summer between um, finishing my undergrad and then starting a research position out in California. And I realized that, you know, what my mom had started as a hobby was really an actual business. And she had done the hardest part. You know, growing a business um, is sort of the fun part, but having the nerve and the fearlessness to start a business, I think, is, um, is the most challenging part. And I realized that Jacksonville... The, the size of the business and the community that we were in, there was so much opportunity to grow it. Um, when you heard you're going, when you said, okay, I'm going away to college and here she's going to start her business, what were you thinking? What did you think about it? I mean, I, I, she, she, she explored a lot of different options. So the, one of the things um, that she looked at, I think my mom has always loved bringing joy to people. And so I think that's where the event side comes in. But she also explored a day spa option. And I was a very big proponent of that. Could have did both, you know, <laughs> catering and day spa. I'm very glad it turned out how it did because it's obviously changed the trajectory of my life. <laughs> um, but, you know, I really didn't have any idea what she had started when I was there. You know, I was, she was talking to me about working and um, I didn't have a real context for that because she'd always been home and, you know, 
um, and well, that focus. What did you major in in college when you were going? Psych and religion and a minor in sociology. Well, the, I totally get the connection there. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's now a happy stress that I'm working with for the most part, but I'm like, this is all manageable. So you came back and then you realized, uh, which really to me, quite frankly, um, the first few years is, is very lonely. I compare that to my own sort of story. So she wasn't there for you the first few years. She's, <laughs> she's six hours away from you. But at that point, you weren't really 100% dependent on it, right? That's what you were saying. Right. Well, one of my first clients was FSCJ, and they liked what we did, and they spread our name through all the campuses. So, you know, again, I had nothing to compare it to. So everything that came in was just great, and I wasn't really depending on making a living on the business. It was more like pay, doing payroll, paying payroll, and adding supplies to the company. I wasn't taking a salary or anything. But when point. you finally started realizing that this is more than a hobby, it's starting actually starting to take off for you, you were good with this. You're, there wasn't a part of you that was saying, yeah, this is more than I wanted. This is more than what I was thinking. Oh, I no, I loved it with so my heart and soul. So you started in love with it more, more. Yeah, absolutely. So now you are after four years, okay, this is no longer a hobby. This is no longer just dabbling. This is going to be real. And then that's when you sort of come in. And then you obviously were down there learning some things. You came back. Tell me about where you were at the moment you came back and what were you thinking? Yeah, so I, I um, thought I was very graciously offering her four months of free labor. Um, and that's when I came in to see that she'd actually created a real business, um, a thriving and sustaining business. And I was, my research was in um, the effects of suicide on bipolar disorder um, or the effects of treatment on suicide and bipolar disorder. And I'd been... I stayed a fifth year to finish my research study and I was kind of alone and it was dark and heavy. And I came back to this industry that was creating like happy moments. It was using some of that stress, um, but in like a really positive way. And um, I was supposed to leave and I had a conversation. I said, do you think that this is something we could maybe do together? And um, my mom like got behind the idea and gave me so much opportunity to grow and do like only a mom would give you that chance with so little experience with four months of um, training under my belt. And, you know, when I came on board, I just, I grabbed the book of lists and I started making phone calls and calling people. And I think in another life I could have been like the best cold caller ever um, because I, I was, you know, we were offering food, so it's a kind of an easy cold call, like, hi, can I drop something off to you? And, you know, to my, what my mom said earlier, we really are, we're a full-service off-premise catering company, but we say that we cater to somebody's life. So whether it's a corporate lunch, it's a graduation party, it's your big corporate gala, it's the wedding, like we try to have services that fit all of those needs. So starting off with the lunch catering um, is how we make that, like we start that relationship and it's kind of an easy um, foot in the door. And then from there we, we try to build trust. Hello. Hi Jennifer, hi Kate. Hi. Hi. You again. This is my fourth class, and I'm super grateful that we have these classes because I've also used them to celebrate special occasions. I had a birthday party all on here, and my mom's 75th birthday, and we didn't really want to brave the restaurants right now with what's going on at the beach. So this is our birthday party for her. So thank you all for coming to her birthday party. I really Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Hi, this is our fifth class and we're really excited to be here. We're grateful for you guys, the group, and we're grateful for having something of substance and excitement for tonight. For those of you who, who have a smaller group of friends, uh, we did a private cooking class with some friends a couple of weeks ago, and it was so much fun. And we consumed a lot of alcohol. <laughs> How did COVID cause these cooking classes? Was it already in the works? When did it start? What's it like? What is, how did COVID affect what you were doing and where do you see it going from here? So COVID wiped out just, I, I would imagine like y'all's, we watched three months of business just disappear and we're still not sure what's happening with business in in-person form um, at the moment. Like we're seeing some of it coming back. But meal delivery and virtual cooking classes were born exclusively from COVID. So 
What is that like? What do you What do you mean when you're saying this? So, which like how that? Are you on a big Zoom call with everyone? What are you doing? Yeah. So with our virtual cooking class. So the way they came about, honestly, with the virtual cooking, Jamie. The, the weekend that before everything happened, I think we were supposed to have an event March 17th, and it was one where we said, we're not comfortable. They're not suggesting more than four, 10 people in um, gathering, and we would be sending 14 team members to this event. So we feel like we have to reschedule this event. And so that weekend was kind of somber and um, filled with some fear. And um, Jamie's like, I think we need to roll out meal delivery. We have a ton of team members. We can do free delivery that can make us stand out. And, you know, I was like, that sounds like a great idea. And then I was scrolling on Facebook, which people say is extremely a, a, a big waste of time, but it turned out to be very productive for me in this moment because somebody was saying, hey, ladies, let's get together and do a virtual cocktail party. And it like kind of sparked this idea. And I was like, we could actually do some of our cooking classes We'd done something called Dinner Club for a while. I said, we could kind of twist that and do cooking classes in a similar way, a virtual party. And so that was on that was on a Friday or Saturday where these ideas were kind of coming through. On Monday, we got in a call with Elizabeth, our catering director, and Justin, our general manager, and we rolled out meal delivery. And Justin was amazing because we sent over the menus. And by that evening, he had added an e-commerce site to our website so that people could order right on our site, which has so much to do with why our meal delivery took off so easily is that we didn't each have to place all of those orders. Somebody didn't have to track us down with working from home and all of those pieces. And then the next day I said to my husband, I said, Jamie, if we're going to do this, these virtual cooking classes, we need to start. And I think it was St. Patrick's Day, not St. Patrick's. Yeah, St. Patrick's Day. I said, so let's do like shepherd's pie. Let's, can you pull the ingredients together? I'm going to reach out to like six or seven friends, see if we can deliver the stuff. Let's just try it because I don't know how this is going to work, but let's just give something a go. So you delivered the ingredients to them. We delivered the ingredients to them. We set up a Zoom call. I'd never done a Zoom call before. I mean, everything we do is kind of in person up to this point. And we just started cooking. And um, from there, we're like, everybody had a good time. They loved that the ingredients were delivered. So is it, is it, the chef, somebody just holding a, f- a camera and doing so it, that with kind of their started, camera phone or something? It kind it started. So it, it did. It, we've, we've progressed a little bit um, from there, but it started with uh, my MacBook being the screen that we were looking at and then using my phone and joining my phone so that people could see the demo close-up screen um, where he was cooking. And at this point now that we've moved up a couple notches, we have um, two webcams that go one from the stove and one to the close-up so that people pin that video and we like toggle it back and forth so they can actually see the instruction. Um, What I think is unique, so typically with our classes, we create a Zoom platform, um, we we create a class concept, we deliver the ingredients, then everybody joins on the Zoom platform. And you get to see what they're doing so you can comment if you see they're doing it wrong or if they don't know how to do something, you can see what they're doing. You're saying, no, you're not so... You know, I meant six ounces of milk, not the whole gallon. So yeah, you know? Jamie's become a pretty good like tell a chef, we say, like yeah. so they can show theirs and he'll be like, leave that on a little bit longer, do this. So we're all really cooking together. And by the end of it, um, the dish is complete. Um, and we have, we've learned a few things that way. Like sushi is one of our popular classes and we teach everybody how to actually make the sushi rice. I want to do that one. That would be cool. Yeah, we're, com- we're doing one coming up. So I'll invite you I as soon as I do Okay, one. yeah. Um, I'm on keto, so I'm not supposed to eat the rice, but it doesn't matter. I, I like sushi, and I like to make sushi. I did it one time. I did all right, but yeah. I, it would be neat to know more. Yeah, it would be a fun class. We'd love for you to yeah. join. Um, and so we send some prepared sushi rice, and then we also show you how to make sushi rice without a rice cooker. And um, this participant has now joined three of our classes. <laughs> but um, on this class, when we talk about like worst-case experiences, when you're doing things in like real time and you're actually letting people communicate back and forth, when they mess something up, it's like, how do I respond to this? Yeah, you're not supposed to burn the house down. <laughs> we have had quite a few fire alarms go off. Um, so we tell them to, to, to put the sushi rice on. We're showing it. Jamie pulls out his portion of the sushi rice. And then we're like, okay, show us your roll. Because um, people love showing their progress of the dish. And this one person shows... Um, her role. And I'm like, well, that's a, that I think a little less rice next time. We'd send enough rice to do about four rolls. And so then we go to roll the second one and she's like, oh, I'm out of rice. (laughs) (laughs) She just made like a sushi burrito. (laughs) What's that going to turn into? So we've since um, shipped all over the country 
to do a virtual cooking classes. So you, you see, hoping and believing that we all believe that the world keeps, you know, we keep getting back to more and more of, of, of the core of why we make our living. You still do see this continuing and you see this evolving? Do you see this growing or do you saying, you know, this is just... So there's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of momentum with it, and it's been really fun. And and the fact that like we've been able to create some national um, accounts where we've had like a bigger reach than what we'd have in Jacksonville, we do want to see it continuing. How do you find them? They found us, which is amazing. How? Like they reached out th- through a Google search. Um, so, so what are you doing? You're putting your cooking our class. Cooking, on they're online. on our website. And we're really not doing any major promotion, so it's interesting how they found us. But they've found us through a like everybody says they found so us. So you're through not Google. doing your own web, or are you? We are. So you're figuring out, or you you know how to put us, you know how to put your company on the, the search engines to people to find. Yes, yeah, so we do have some you. of the SEO, yeah, That's um, awesome. those pieces. Um, again, that is Justin, our GM. Like he is just, he's very savvy on that side, and so he's helped us really expand our reach on that piece. So um, we've had people reaching out the month of July, we did 40, we had 44 people um, that we sent kits to from New York, Martha's Vineyard, San Diego, um, Beverly Hills 90210. I was like totally sweating when I got that one. I was like, are we sophisticated enough to do this class? Um, And then um, we have through the month of July right now, we have nine shipping um, clients where we're going all over. How much does cost? Um, so the classes, if we're shipping with the personal instruction, it's 150 to $200. Um, and that includes the private class, the, the kit, and then the delivery as well. And when it's private class, it's, like, it's not just one-on-one though. No, um, we have a minimum of like 10 to 15. We're, okay. we're sort of in flux there. Um, and then, but we do, we have classes booked for up to 80 people. So is this two hours? Yeah, it takes about two hours because the first part, depending on the size of the class, we get everybody on, we tell a little bit about who we are and what our story is. And then they either introduce, like if it's a smaller class, 20 people are under it, they'll go through and say who they are, something about them. We usually start with something we're grateful for because we're big believers in being grounded in gratitude, which I know there's lots of talk about not needing to be positive all the time. But I just think if we focus on what is working as opposed to what isn't working, things typically turn out better. Um, and then we jump into the class ingredients that they fingers crossed have received, um, what equipment they need. And, um, then everybody starts cooking. So you ship them everything they need, but the utensils, right? Everything besides the equipment. Yeah. And so when you're shipping some of this, some of the stuff has to remain cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that's been, that's what I think has been so awesome for us in this time. Like when there's so much fear about what's happening with our business is that we've had to instead, like it's been a time of learning for us. So we've, We've been learning how to negotiate shipping rates um, with UPS um, and then also how to actually package the ingredients so that they keep their temperature. Um, and so we ship right now everything next day air, but all of our kits are meant to be able to last 48 hours so that there's margin for error when you're you know, dealing with a shipping company like UPS. Your order is really not that important to them. So sometimes um, next day air means like, nine o'clock the next day. And we shipped to friends all around the country to see how it worked first. Yeah, our first Do you post this on YouTube for people to find later or not? You don't do that? So this is like something I need to talk to y'all about, honestly, because the next (laughs) thing that we want to be doing is, um, is figuring out how to do, is to playing around with like some live stream videos, like using YouTube so that we can get a broader audience. Um, The Alaska, the marketing company for Alaska Seafood has actually reached out to us about doing a brand partnership, which... We thought was fun is this and the exciting. one that has like those enormous crab legs and all that? Yeah, I've done that one time. Yeah. It was really cool. Um, and really, it was really expensive, but it was really cool. Yeah, so they reached out yeah. to us, and one of the things we realized if we wanted to do any more of those things, um, like part of it is getting the reach out there so that more people can um, experience what we're doing and some of the products that we're coming across that we really like. It is. Um, Definitely part of our world now, all this uh, web streaming, video streaming stuff. We're doing a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, you ought to have seen some of that stuff on it. But it is, I, I don't think it's ever going to take away from uh, any kind of total in-person sort of scenario. But I do believe there's going to be a certain uh, type of hold on about how some of that's going to be on there. So I don't think it's ever going to go away. Right. I think it's going to supplement. You know? Like, yeah. But we want to get together. People want to see each other. You, I, I don't think... Um, it felt good when our staff started coming back at the beginning, even though we were coming back sporadic. It was just good to be around people. Absolutely. Where I think our classes, 
there's a market for our classes to continue um, is with family and like corporations that have East and West Coast, you like, or that aren't in the same shared space that allows you to do some company events where people don't have to fly or travel to get there to oh. still stay connected on a more regular basis. Um, and that's what we're finding that people are liking, not that it would replace that. We also find that people are enjoying learning to cook in their own kitchen because it's amazing to go to some of these great show kitchens um, but you don't always have that equipment at your disposal. Yeah. And so getting comfortable in your own kitchen. You is, haven't found that when you say, I'm shipping you all the ingredients, but not the equipment, that they don't have the equipment that you're thinking so that they would naturally have? We gear all of our equipment. So all of our classes, so far we've done gumbo, gnocchi, pepperadelli, um, chicken frank taste. Gumbo I would do. I would have attended that. I would have, I would have been yeah. part of that one. I could do that. Sushi. The roux, that's where I always screw yeah. up. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it was it was fun watching people do that like and in, in going through the color changes. Um Paella. And so everything that we've done, we've pretty much done, um, obviously needing a stove and an oven, but a whisk, a four to six quart um, pot with tight fitting lid and like a knife. I mean, saute pan, like we've scaled everything down to like back to the basics because when this started with COVID, we knew that people couldn't go out and get something. Um, and we also, while we have a catering company with some pretty sophisticated kitchen equipment, our house does not have a lot of that sophisticated equipment because we cook so much at home or at work. Um, so we kept it really simple. What do y'all need help on? Space. <laughs> we are busting at the seams and we just, we just expanded last year. So. Yeah, I think space is something. And then I also think, you know, people, we get a lot of compliments on our, our displays, but I think that, Finding a source that can help us create like custom displays, that's what really, I think, sets so many companies apart is... Um, the whole presentation. The presentation. And, and that's... I'm sorry, Jen, I didn't mean to speak over you. But from the very beginning when I was doing 9.95 lunches at FSCJ, two and three and four times a week, we always did a display. We never just came in, dropped the food, and that really set us apart. And people really appreciate that. I do think that's the interesting thing, you know, with my mom starting this company as a front of house person, as opposed to like a, a back of house kitchen person, is that our company's always been equally, there's been an equal emphasis on food and service, which we feel like is kind of a hallmark. Like there's a lot of companies that are amazing on one side or the other. And we really feel like no event is awesome unless both of those pieces. So when, how do you know you're cutting edge? How do you know you stay cutting edge? How, where do you get your ideas? What, what does the industry play a role overall? What are you doing? Are you Google searching? Are you going to the associations? Uh, I mean, all of us are trying to just look and see what everybody wants. How do you do it? Yeah, I think, I mean, our team gets together. We're always brainstorming on things. I mean, I think that that comes in so many different forms. Um, our team goes to Cater Source, which is one of the largest catering events mm -hmm. within the industry. Um, we definitely like go on Pinterest. We're searching companies that we respect outside of the city. We we follow them on Facebook, on Instagram. Check out their websites for ideas. Um, and then you know we try to stay engaged with other people within the industry because ideas feed off of each other. Um, and then our clients give us lots of ideas too. Okay, this is putting you on the spot. Pick one thing that you think is trendy or cool or hip or cutting edge, right? I just, I don't care how little it is. Just tell me something that you feel like that people are sort of wanting right now. Well, I mean, I keep talking about these chef curated stations, but we really like them. We've found like before all of these pieces happen, but where people are actually, this isn't just like a carving station with the chef there doing something. It's the chef is there making risotto, putting those pieces together, painting the plate so that it's, it, it, it feels like, you know, that open kitchen feel where they're seeing what's happening. Um, I think it feeds to the I've pan plate experience, oh. you know, where people are liking that um, on that side. And then, you know, fusion and um, ups, like dressing up like gourmet, Gucci gourmet food, I think is always, you know, has been around for a while. So what, what's that. the most popular food that people always ask out of you? Oh, I mean, what do you think? I mean, they ask for everything across the board. Um, people love, I mean, it's like I hate to say it, but people love barbecue in this town. I mean, and so finding ways, that's where we sometimes feel tasked to like get creative is like how do we make something like pulled pork or brisket yep. interesting. Um, and so that's where, you know, like combining some of these ingredients together, combining some things, presentation, um, 
taking simple ingredients, um, you know, like one of the things that we do is like a short rib meatloaf, you know, so like it's that comfort food of what it is, but we're using nicer ingredients like the short rib to dress what it up. Is, is that what you, or let me ask you, what do you think you do best? I know you want to say all of it, anything, but I, no, come on, be real. What do you want, what do you think you do best? That doesn't mean it, it's everybody. Thinks I think our company excels in plated dinners. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Okay. I'm an entree because I was curious. <laughs> right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you know. Um, oh, okay. As an entree. Well, like two. Like I or, mean, we or have appetizer. A, what is it that you do? You have a signature something? We have. We do have a couple signature dishes, which um, it's surprising, but some of our best cuisine I think is um, Asian, Asian and French, um, and those are Jamie's kind of backgrounds. And mm-hmm. so he, um, so we do a miso sake glazed cod. Um, or halibut. It can go on a few different books, black cod or halibut. It is an absolutely stunning dish. Um, people talk about it all the time. I've been on keto since like January. Okay. I need some keto cooking classes. You know, it's, I, I am trying to be as creative as I possibly can. Sometimes it's great. Yes. Sometimes, no, that ain't working. Well, we do have a couple. We haven't tried them yet, but we actually have a couple of recipes we're going to play around with to put on our meal delivery. Um, because a keto company reached out to us and it didn't end up working, um, but they were working on a brand sponsorship with somebody and wanted us to help create the dishes yeah. um, so that that person could just be the face. Um, so I, we do have some keto powders and things that we're going to work on playing around with. Um, I have not done any of the keto, but I hear great things about it. Oh, I got so many ideas. Yeah. But I'm trying, I'm trying to stay with it and all. How do you, uh, when you guys are sourcing your ingredients, how do you make sure that those ingredients that you're getting are top quality? So I think it's, do you want to? Well, I was just going to say, we source locally anytime we can. And, um, the rest of our stuff usually comes from uh, Cheney Brothers, and we always order. So does the big semi pull up and drop off? It does, but we always order top quality. But um, I, I mean, I think some of that is the same thing with like y'all having other vendors. It's like you're using you use vendors who hold to the same standard and that trust those things. Um, so we do work with um, Cheney has been a wonderful vendor, and they carry a lot of products. Um, local products that you can actually get through their distribution. Um, we work with um, Blue Buddha for a lot of our like produce and local vegetables. And then we will work with like small farms. Um, we do a lot of work with um, Tracy at Atlantic Beach Urban Farms. And um, she is like has awesome sources for like, she's put us in touch with some like great cheese purveyors. Does the price vary each time you place an order based upon the supply? Prices are always subject to change, which is interesting in our business when you're booking things out a year in advance. Um, and so there is a caveat within our contract um, that states that we have the ability to offer a comparable product, like to give you the option to either change the price based on market pricing or to give you a suggested option that would keep you at that price. Did, how has uh, Corona or COVID-19 I, uh, changed the pricing. Oh, well, meat prices have gone like skyrocketed. Um, so they've been much higher for us. And just the ability to get some of those products in right. have been really tough. Um, I do have to give one more shout out to Cheney um, because when we talk about the semi driving up, yeah. so our commissary that we're busting out of the seams with is about 3,500 square feet. And when we started working with Feeding Northeast Florida and we were doing 500 meals um, 500 meals a day for them, plus the things that we were doing, we were running, we, we didn't have the space. And so we reached out to Cheney and um, they delivered one of their semis that they left parked um, in our oh, cool. drive. Yeah, so that we would have like additional dry um, fridge and freezer space. Did you see that partnership with Northeast Florida, Feeding Northeast Florida continuing? So we've, we're actually, we've, we've stopped for the moment. Um, their demand was dropping off and then our ability to like execute other things was starting to pick back up. So we've left it in a place that if they end up needing um, assistance again, that we're here and like ready. Um, but we were in a place that we were able to bring our team back on and um, their resources that were needing it were able to start producing again. Are there other local partnerships that you guys are... Um I guess, developing or looking out for right now within the community, or is it really? Yeah, so one of the things that we're working on um, and looking into, and it's harder than it seems, is a place to take our leftover product, like to a um, 
like a nonprofit or soup kitchen that could use that product because there's so many liability pieces that come in. But we sometimes end up with, you know, we feel like we have a pretty good ratio of what our quantity should be. Um, but in this in this business of catering, you always want to have more food than not enough food. So it breaks our heart to um, to have to you know, dump food. So if a client doesn't want it, we're working on a place where we could actually take some of that food. What you guys think? It is a miso glazed pod with an Asian lo mein salad and spring rolls. Wow. It's fancy. Where do those tongues go? Oh, he's getting fancy over there. I know. What? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything. He, he, the, he put the noodles down first. I did see that. Yeah. I mean, so, I've been working. Wait, it looks like he put the sauce on. No, I, I looked. He had just the noodles on the plate. I've been working on my plating skills, guys. So let's see if we can. All right. I can't. Um... I can't relate to one thing that you said because I still can't do it. You said you did cold calling. I've, oh. been, I've been in business now 26 years and I, I, no matter how much people think, yeah, Randy, you have so much, you know, I still can't do that. So I, I, did you do any of that cold calling? I call did it? a lot of it. I'd you call just called people and said, don't you want me to actually cater something? I don't have anything planned. I'd you like, <laughs> well, we would bring a lunch presentation for their staff. You would just look. Like the point, and the, I don't know if the yellow pages were the way. You just pick someone. How did you know who to even cold call? I mean, I can come up with names, but I still don't have it in me to just cold call. Right. So I guess you and I want to ask you too. So go ahead, you first. Different businesses that came to mind, we would just call up and say, Hi, Randy. I'm Liz with the Chef's Garden. And we have. How did you know who to ask for? Well, usually we would ask for somebody in um, human resources. Because they could always steer us to the right person, and that worked. or administrative assistance. So you bring them a lunch, a lunch with a bow on it, stuff, and then you're just hoping that they're going to remember and call right. you. Did, did they? Absolutely. Really? They did. You still do that? We do. Well, we don't wrap our food up anymore because it just there's too there's too many lunches going out to be able to do that. But we do still call people and offer them. Uh, lunch so that they can get to know us. Yeah, yeah. Well, get me back on that list. Did you? Um, <laughs> did you? How did you get involved in the cold calling? Did you say this is working, or did you just say like I can take it from here? I can start actually making more of these connections. Did you not feel some sense of, oh God, you're just calling people thinking that they want to spend money with? Well, what I loved is the fact that like with cold calling and at the time I just come back to Jacksonville and none of my friends lived here. I knew I wasn't calling any of my friends. So really they didn't know who I was. So I would just say, this is Jen with Chef's Garden. I would like to talk to somebody that's in your events department. Can I bring you something by? And I really think one of the cornerstones of Chef's Garden is perseverance. So those relationships took some time, but we just sort of dug our heels in and decided to make relationships. That is part of how we ended up at the comer. So yeah. it became like on our vision board or on our like dream is that we would be catering events at the comer. And you've been in this industry a long time. So you probably know Susan Mala who was over oh, there. Yeah, very much. So. And Susan became a dear friend and a wonderful advocate for our business. But I cannot tell you how many calls went to Susan that were like very politely like, I will take that under consideration, you know, like, um, and so they had, we now have the cafe inside the Kemmer Museum, but it was at one point just a coffee counter. And I think what happened is we ended up catering a, a friend of ours, did a surprise engagement at the Kemmer. They brought us in for it. So that was like, we'd, we'd been hounding Susan. Our friend brought us in for a small event. In the Italian gardens. Yeah. It was gorgeous. When you could still do something in the Italian gardens. And we went above and beyond. You know, I mean, we just put everything into it so that she could see what we could do. And in that conversation, she mentioned this coffee counter, which I was like, I'm not interested in this coffee counter. My mom was like, oh, well, that could be a foot in the door. Um, this goes back to perseverance because it took us quite a few years as just a coffee counter. But we ended up accepting that deal. Um, and with that, we got exclusive in-house catering. At that the took a while too. Yeah, I'm sure. And well, and eventually we got exclusive in-house catering right away, but we didn't get exclusive catering right away. Right. Um, and so we were able to do some of their um, PN or PDL and members openings and things like that. And those events, they had very small budgets, 
but at least we were able to get creative and figure out how we use that budget to cover our costs. We weren't necessarily making money off of those events, but they became showcase pieces for us for the in front of the right clientele, building that trust relationship with the museum. And then from that coffee counter, there was some tables in the concourse. We started serving lunch, um, like actually bringing it out to the table. And um, eventually it clicked like, oh, this could actually be a cafe. And so when they decided to make that expansion, we were able to then have a conversation and enough history where they'd seen what we could do that they entertained the idea of having an exclusive catering relationship with taking on that responsibility. When you, so let's move away from the cold calling. I want to ask you this. You know, um, when I talk to my staff, they have a different uh, perspective than, but I recognize their optics are different than mine. When I ask them, what's the hardest, what do you think the hardest thing is of having a business? I would ask them. They would always think the execution. And I'm saying, no, the hardest thing in business to me and always has been, is to make that phone ring. The easy part is filling the order. Even though most people are going to disagree with me, I'm like, that's the hardest thing in the world to get someone to call and want to give you money mm -hmm. to do something. And then the next thing is going to be to actually get them to commit to give you money because now they're trusting you for something. And so I still realize that when it's time to do the work, my job is usually moving on to something else because I find that to be, um, I don't want to say the easy part, but to some extent, I said, as far as a business future, the hardest thing in the world to get that phone to ring. I'm curious. Uh, I would assume you probably could ask some of the people that work for you and they're going to probably look at it and say, in all the execution, you're not putting enough weight on that. No, if you don't deliver what you say you're going to do and more, the phone just doesn't ring again. Right. So to keep them to keep ringing, the hardest thing in the world, which I'm happy to say I have a lot of them, is people that just have called me for 26 years. That's what I'm most proud of. Mm -hmm. the, I, the, not the one-offs, the, the ones that will keep calling for 26 years. And so when it comes to y'all, I'm just curious how you look at that. And I'm curious how you would, um, how do you feel now you're getting your business? Well, back to what you were saying, mm -hmm. we're first selling ourselves. We're building a relationship with that person just like you did that keeps calling you for 26 years. Oh. And they have to know that they can trust you. We know what we're going to send them is going to be good. So it's just digging your heels in and building that relationship and strengthening that relationship through the years. So 19 years, right? 19 years for you. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think, I think some of it is, I would agree, selling ourselves, getting the phone to ring. I think one of... The, the other two pieces to that, I think, are keeping a team together. You know, it is creating culture within an organization, I think, starts with um, the people running the organization, but then also bringing people on that sort of cultivate that piece, um, which leads to, like, such great execution to what you were saying. Um, but the other thing that I think is one of the best things that we never want to talk about is some of the keys to keeping those relationships are how you salvage the relationship when you your team did fall short in some way. And I feel like it's happened to all of us if we've been in business long enough that there are times where you're like, that was, for whatever the reason, something didn't work exactly like it's supposed to. And we've really encouraged with our team how important it is to be grateful to have that call and have an opportunity to make it right. Because the person who moves on from you and then becomes the one-off client is the one that doesn't feel like it's worth having a conversation with you so that you can make it right. Wow, you have... You, you've now made me think of so many different things. So I got to ask several things. First of all, um, when it comes to the staff, how many work for y'all full time? I have no earthly idea. And how many do you work when you're, I mean, I assume it's an undetermined on a num number when you get certain business on certain days. So right now we have 16 people that work for us full time. Full time. Mm -hmm. full wow. Time. And that's then a lot considering what you're doing as far as, you know, uh, offsite catering, which I know you're still. Are you still operating in, in the camera at the moment? So we reopen this coming Saturday, which will probably after this airs, but that's June 20th. We're yeah. reopening um, in a limited capacity um, that only the gardens are opening and then we'll be moving inside eventually. Um, so that does include some of that staff. And that is why we've pivoted so hard in some of these other areas is to find ways to keep our team going on that How side. did you... Did you keep these 16 people going during the worst of all this? We did, and we actually hired two extra people 
and our our staff at the Comer. What did they do? Hand you napkins so you can wipe your tears during all this? <laughs> <laughs> That's what the last two did. We, you know, honestly, and I thank Jamie and Jen and the whole team for doing this, but they got together and they put together great menus for food delivery. They did started this um, virtual cooking class, which has taken off like crazy. That our staff at the Comer were the only ones that had to be furloughed, and it kind of worked out for them because they had kids they needed to homeschool, yeah. and so we were. That was our biggest concern was our staff. Well, and that's why the Feeding Northeast Florida project was so good. They actually some of those were furloughed from our team, but able to work in our kitchen and then be paid by Feeding Northeast Florida, okay. which was. You said also mm-hmm. when things don't always go as planned. Okay, I'll share. You share. Okay. <laughs> Give me some worst stories. No name. Just tell me some of the worst things that happened. I'll tell you a couple of mine. I've got the best one. I've got the best one. This was this has been years ago. We we were doing like three weddings that night, which was big for us at the time. And I was at one, and I forget who was at the other one, but my team captain called me and said, "We are running out of chicken, and the bride's family and their best friends." are in line. And I said, okay, I'll be right there. So I knew I couldn't get him any chicken in that short amount of time. So I get in my car and I'm like, tell me what to do. So I called Crystal and I ordered like 200 cheeseburgers. I ran by there and picked them up. I met the father as soon as I got there, apologized sincerely to him. We passed out crystals while everybody was dancing. On silver trays. On silver trays and having a good time. And then we did a dinner for 10 at their house. And they've called us to cater different events throughout the years. In all honesty, as much as you feel like it'd be the worst. That that's, that's not the family. worst. That's not the worst. I need, you got to go deeper. I know, I've got, I know we have <laughs> to. to me, good, good story, but it's not the worst. To There's me, no way. To me, running out of food or being late well, yes, are yes. the two worst things Okay, in the so world. did you ever run out? I'm like, oh God, we can't do anything about it. I mean, they're, it's, they're not where, maybe we, somebody that worked for you was like, I, I mean, I got stories. So I will say there are times, I don't think we've ever actually run, and we may have, have we had a place where we had something happen recently um, where we were doing a brunch on Amelia Island. Oh my gosh, this is this is a small one, but this was like an out of body experience. So one of our greatest and longest employees, she is wonderful. We were catering their wedding the next day or that evening. We were catering their wedding that evening. He works with the Jaguars. It was a pretty big affair that was going on. They asked us to add a brunch on that morning. We were like, absolutely. I think it was 50 people. Our delivery driver leaves, leaves her phone with the um, GPS and then proceeds to get lost. And she shows up for this brunch two hours after. We can't get in touch with her to figure out where she is. We're trying to figure out, like, we. she stops and calls us at a couple places, like at a gas station. She's like, I'm trying to find it. I don't even know what happened. It was such a bizarre experience. What did we end up doing? We, we were calling the, the mother or the mother of the groom who was putting on the brunch. And um, I got in the car, went out, picked up some, or I didn't pick it up. I had it delivered from uh, like chicken biscuits and uh, I dropped champagne It's, it's pretty there. bad when you're hiring a high-end catering company and you're instead giving them fast food. I mean, it that was, is a pretty like low it moment was the, for it us. Was, it was bad. And fortunately, the wedding was knock your socks off perfect. And I've always said in business, we'll make a mistake. Never try to explain it away. Never try to push it off on some other circumstance. Just look that person in the eye, take responsibility for it, apologize sincerely, and do the best you can to recover from it. I have eventually got to a point where I felt like everything went great at certain events years ago. And then I looked, and I'm real, in a sense, almost proud. And then I realized later, I said, there, just, just, just recognize what you're saying, Randy. There, first of all, there's no such thing ever as a perfect event. Because if you went back in time, it might be the smallest thing. You would probably change something. You would probably change something. So, so 
this journey, not destination. Don't ever think you're there. Don't mm-hmm. ever think you got it because here comes something else. And in the end of it, you, you, you build. And so there's no doubt with all the years y'all been around too that you, you've been there, done that, seen that, you know how to respond to it, and you're going to continue to see it again and see other things and how you continue to develop to understand how you're going to respond to the challenges. And when you think you've seen all the challenges, you, they get somewhat recycled, but a different twist that makes you just grow a little bit more. Right, COVID, <laughs> COVID shows up. So, yeah. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> well, it's crazy, too. You put so many checklists in place, and you put people in place to make sure that none of this – goes wrong and you know murphy's law it will it will the, yeah. so you think you got it you know murphy's gonna come in and tell you no you don't and well, the <laughs> hardest thing is having a wonderful employee that's been there since the doors opened who knows she's totally great that the next one. okay proudest moment <laughs> give me proudest. a proudest moment thing you talked about that give me something that you're just the opposite now so still my most favorite amazing event that we've ever done and it's because of like it's it's the journey is that we got Cummer Ball, the first Cummer Ball we did. which Their 50th anniversary. Okay. 50th anniversary Cummer Ball, um, which I don't remember which year that was. But, you know, we started at a coffee counter doing stuff that, like, didn't really make sense. And then um, and our, our probably main competitor had done Cummer Ball for many, many years. And um, we were now in this new relationship. We were changing the contract where we'd be in, in-house. And we were like, how does this affect Cummer Ball? This would be considered in-house to us. And um, Hope McMath was the director at the time. And she said, can y'all do this? And, you know, this is the thing about business. You always say, you, if you're a true entrepreneur, you can do it. You know, like, and you figure out how you're going to do it after. So we said, we absolutely can do I it. I relate to that. Yes. And she said, okay, then I, we're going to build it in. Um, and so we got the contract. And... Now, like looking back, I think it was 300 people. No, it was 640 people. I remember that. Mm -hmm. 600 biggest ball that they'd had. Our chef wrote risotto on the menu, and I'm like, do you think we can make risotto for 640 people? Because you have to serve that right away. It's not something that can sit and hold. And I remember seeing down the corridor going out, you know, to the loading dock, probably 20 chefs stirring that risotto and my friend was there and they're Italian and they travel and they're used to great food she came and found me after the risotto course and she said the risotto was perfect and I from that point on was able to breathe easy yeah what what do you want what do you want chef's garden to be when you grow up so I love the company Chef's Garden is right now. I'm really proud of like the events that we're doing and all of these pieces. What we've I've loved some of these new avenues that we've added. And so one of the things that we before all of this happened, before our world got turned upside down, one of the pieces that we've struggled with as a business is that to do some of these really wonderful creative events is that um, there's a high price of entry for somebody to be able to hire us to do something, which means that our community can be smaller. Um, and so what we've loved about the time, what loved is maybe the wrong word to use, but what has been a great opportunity when COVID came is that we've been able to do, we've built a meal delivery division, and then we've done these virtual cooking classes. And there's a small price, you know, like almost anybody can afford then to experience our catering. And so we love the fact that we've built this bigger community. Um, and so that's what we want is a company that has a couple different um, divisions within our business. And then we really want, and you can speak to this too, um, but I think we really want to be the company that people go to from an event side when they don't know that there's somebody else that can execute it, you know, that they can trust to deliver creativity and not just creativity on paper, but creativity on execution and that they know that each team member really is giving it that same 150% that we've given it in time. And that's probably the moment, the thing I'm the most proud of is that we have team members that give 150% when I'm ready to not give 150% on some days where I'm like, is that really necessary? And they're like, yes, that's the standard that we've set. You know, like I love having people that hold me accountable as much as I hold them accountable. We are very fortunate with the team that we have. What do you not like about what you do? Oh my gosh. I mean, it's really hard to have a life. You know, like sometimes it's hard to build in some of those times and to learn, you know, as much as we talk about this and this comes to the team, like, and and I, I probably could have more of a life than I have. I'm trying to learn that. 
But is learning to let go, it's so hard when you've become so invested in something to do what you've said is to walk away um, and start selling the next event as opposed to being in all pieces of it. Um, and that is something that I'm still like where I am in our career, my career learning that I don't have to keep my hand in every piece of the process. And you got to be willing to accept they're not going to do it the way you would do it. And you're going to have to let it happen. Right. But if, but I will tell you, I live in that world where I'm going to say, fine, if I'm going to walk away from it, act like it doesn't exist. But if you ever call me and I come out, now I am going to make it my way. Right. If not, you should not have called me. So what they're going to say, do not call Randy. Do not call Randy. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong. But right. I'm like, don't call me. Because at that point when I come in, I'm now going to give that 150% and I see it differently. That doesn't make what you're doing wrong. It just makes me say, I, I'm going to do everything I possibly can and rely on anything that I feel like that experience offers me mm -hmm. to be able to help get through that. So it there's a good side of that. You, it, it doesn't mean that they still won't go through their learning moments as, as, as stuff, you know, comes here. But at the same point, yes, I've looked back at things and I say, yeah, it went great. It, maybe, maybe it could have, uh, right. uh, went worse if I was there. <laughs> 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 you don't ever want to really admit that, but you've seen things that it's like, this is pretty cool. Right. And so to feel that I'm not needed at key things, it's the greatest feeling in the whole wide world that you don't have to be involved in every single thing. But that trust factor is the hardest growing pain to me for yeah. any business when you put everything you got around the clock mm -hmm. and you absolutely are not involved in something that's extremely uh, important and high end and whatever, large attendance, whatever it winds up being, and you've let it go. And yeah. you've that trust... It's earned. It's not given. It's earned, and you, you, you always, you always have that thought behind you, like, oh god, oh god, oh god. It's right, kind of bittersweet. <laughs> it's like, it's like giving the baby away, yeah. you know, and making sure that it's going to be okay. We've been enjoying your weekly specials and eating wonderful. So thank you very much. This is our second uh, meal. Uh, with uh, with you, and we had a blast the first time. We're cooking tonight for my parents who are celebrating their monumental seven birthdays. Sorry, that's right, monumental birthdays. They wouldn't want me to share, but they're. <laughs> <laughs> what I ask with um, family here, only the two, the, only the two of y'all are involved as far as family. Well, my husband. Okay, so yeah. he's involved in mm -hmm. it, and. Uh, How's that, how's that working out? It's great. <laughs> it really is great. We have a policy that once you walk inside the building, it's business. And we have been able to adhere to that. And besides being family, we're good friends. So, you know, people go, you see each other on the weekend too? Yeah, because when we're at work, we're working. And... I I think the hardest part is um, not talking about work when we're not working. That is the hardest you know? part. Oh, I, ha I have that rule. Yeah. I have that rule. I just won't do it. Yeah. Well, we need to, we need to, but, but I will, that but rule. I will tell you, going back to something we said at the beginning of the whole conversation, it's absolutely, um, it's either in you or not in regards to being in this type of industry because there is no real off button. Right. So at this moment, you either love it or hate it. If you look at it as a job, you know you're going to move on. You right. know you're going to move on because it's just something you do versus it being part of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so in my sense, what my, I'm curious how y'all would respond to this, but I would say I don't need to have a client come up to me and tell me how much they love it and pat me on the back and just say, this is great. Thank you so much. I don't really need that. I get mostly uh, rewarded when I feel like that I felt like I understood what the objective was. I walk in, I can see it. For, I, I get it. I, I, I feel like I understand it. I feel like that we reached what we were trying to reach and we did what we, in the fulfillment and the instant gratification of that. That's why I could never work at a place and would be like on an assembly line because you don't right. get to see the finished product. Right. You don't get to see the reaction. So if I, I would be the kind of guy that I don't want to make the nuts and bolts for a toy. I want to see the kid playing with the toy. I want that instant reward. And so live events give you that instant reward that, 
it's nice to hear when other people feel that way, but you don't really always need it because you just sort of know. You can feel it, yeah. You can feel that you're doing what you were hoping to do for them and you're getting them to maybe not see the mechanics of what you're doing, but get caught up in maybe the good, bad, or the emotion of the messaging and what right. is trying to be delivered. Well, I think like to your point also, the longer that you're in this business, you don't need the the client, you do. I mean, we love the client to say how happy they are. We all like that. But you can feel when the client's happy. You know, it's that intuition, like where you know, and you can see that their guests are happy. And you, you know, I love when um, our team will come back, like if I'm in the kitchen um, sending food out, like I love when they're like, oh my gosh, people are like loving it. Or I'm seeing plates coming back that are empty. You know, like that's our biggest sign um, that people are enjoying what we're doing. That's I, um, I would give advice to anybody that wanted to be in this hospitality event sort of industry, if you can find anything else to do for a living, you probably should do it. <laughs> I, it's it, not family friendly. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's going to take a good amount of your attention, even when you're not supposed to be giving it attention. Right. But if you do find some sense of what I was talking about earlier of that, fulfillment of uh, trying to find your place in the world on a professional level, then you can't have to do this. Right. It's not going to turn out very well. You've got to give it all you got and you're just going to have to hope and believe that the order you get with every year that would go by more and more, you can be hopefully slightly more selective. And, and, and I don't know what age and there's not, or how many years, I don't know what that means, but to grow to a point that you can say the things that, that, most fulfill you can be the things that you still continue on in your journey, but there's no sense of real retirement. That's tough. That's tough for me to vision. Well, I think, you know, talking about trusting people that I think the hardest thing with having downtime in this business is like learning to let go. Um, and you said it at the beginning is that there's a lot of people within your company and within our company that are capable of executing things without us being there. And it's learning that you don't have to be there, you know, like that. And what you said and, um, it being bittersweet that um, your team knows that you don't need to be there. It's like you learning that you don't need to be there, you know, like, and you being okay with the fact that you don't need to be there because you can't have balance if you don't come to that realization because then you feel like you have to be everywhere. And that's what um, I'm working on personally. And I think what we love so much about the meal delivery and the virtual cooking classes is that we never would like, the intention would never be for those to replace um, in-person events because we love them and our team loves them. You know, like our team, our, our team probably doesn't love meal delivery and virtual cooking classes as much as I've loved them. What I love about them is it's been something different, but I also see it as an opportunity to create other revenue streams that can stay so that we can be more selective with some of the catering events that we do and not selective where we're only doing events that are of a certain price point, but where we're the client, we really mesh with the client, like food is important to the client. Um, and that, you know, this business can be hard and to, it's always nice when you're working with clients to really value what you're bringing to the table on that side of things. Any subject or anything you can think of that we haven't talked about that you wanted to make sure that you wanted to sort of talk about anything else you can think of? I guess... When Jennifer came on board, she, um, because she was my daughter, I, she said I let her do a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have let someone else do, but I had a lot of confidence in her. And um, she kind of got trained baptism through fire. And I always told her that um, the two main things in business for me is always surround yourself with good people. That's the key to running a good business and treat them right and reward them generously and to always think of each event as the last event you're doing. That, you know, you're only as good as your last event. So give that event 150%. And then when it's time for the next one, you give that one 150%. And I think that has stuck with Jennifer and... Yeah. Our team feels that, and I think that's really um, what has made us successful. Jen, what was your favorite home-cooked meal to eat growing up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my mom probably doesn't want me to say it because it's not like a fancy one, but she um, 
would make this chicken and rice casserole that was my absolute favorite. Mm. Um, she's made it for me since. And now that we're in this industry and we eat so much like, wonderful food all the time, and I'm like, that's so surprising that that was my favorite meal, but it still <laughs> has this little spot in my heart yeah. for sure. We always had a beautiful table. And um, a lot of times it was food to go. I, you know, I would cook for parties, but we all had different schedules growing up. So we would try to sit down and eat, but I, ne- I didn't necessarily cook every night. I, but we always had a beautiful table setting. Yeah. That was important to me. The thing that's interesting for me is all my memories growing up weren't necessarily about the food, but we always had a house full of people. Like she okay. was always entertaining. People were always there. And it's something that I struggle with now being a parent and, and running a catering company is that I'm always around people, but I'm not always creating those moments within my house. And so I have such fond memories of that is like, that is my motivation for trying to create some of that time so that my kids grow up with that same sense and that they love parties because it's easy if your parents are always going to work at a party to not love parties, you know, like to see it as kind of like stealing time. And um, that perspective actually, I think is, it's going to help me be better at like letting go of some of those, some of that control. So we end every episode with some lightning round. I'll let you guys ask the questions, but they're meant to just be really okay. quick, short answers. If you guys you want, to. Let's you want to say start? one question on my yeah. lightning round lasted five minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> let's see how y'all do. Yeah, where okay. do you want to start, Leah? Um, what's one seasoning everyone should have in their kitchen? Um, oh, salt and salt, pepper. Pe- salt and pepper mix. Yeah. If you weren't in Jacksonville, where would you be? Um, Seattle. Gosh, I've been here forever. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be in New York. That's where we like, uh, like every summer. Yeah, I summer, love New like, York. Yeah. Well, since you've been here forever, what's your favorite thing about Jacksonville? You know, I really love everything about Jacksonville. We have the beach. We have a, a good cultural scene going on. Um, I know so many people here. It's, you know... When you go out, you're you're always seeing friendly faces. We have great places to go walk and hike, and I, I just, you know, I really don't have any place to compare it to because I've lived here all my yeah. life. I love the sense of community. I mean, I think to what yeah. you're saying, like there is a good sense of like support, and um, that's what I. It's been awesome to build a business within this community. Right. Do you have any uh, just general cooking tips for people to cook better? Um, don't listen to my cooking tips. <laughs> listen to my husband's. Um, so I am. Um, I I fall on the front of house side of our business too. So people are always surprised. I was telling um, my best friend we were talking about these classes, these Jen and Jamie cooking classes, and she's like, I think it should probably be like Shara and Jamie since Jen can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> but I think anything you you serve, if you make it pretty garnish it, put it on something pretty, have something great to drink with it, and have good company. I mean, obviously, food is the essence of what we do. And But when you're just, you know, wanting to have people over, you just make it look fun and festive and happy, and you've got a great party. Yeah, who was the chef that said that you first eat with your eyes? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, we- you know, when I shop, everything I shop for – is something that we can use as a vessel for food. I've done that. You know, I, I would carry stuff home all the time. My husband would say, why did you buy that? I'm not sure. I just know that I'm going to have a use for it. And the next thing you know, we're serving, you know, something crazy on it. Well, we really appreciate you guys coming in. This has been awesome. And I can't wait to try one of those virtual cooking yeah. classes. It's a really Where interesting would, idea. Where would somebody go to sign up for one of the cooking classes? Yeah. So you can yeah. sign up yeah, on our website. Question. Yeah, that'd be great. If you go to www.cateringjacksonville.com, um, there's three links on there now, catering, meal delivery, and virtual cooking. And so meal delivery will take you right to our um, e-commerce for that. And then virtual cooking will take you to our cooking classes. I do want to say, I guess, um, as as uh, I guess the lead of PRI Productions. I mean, I've I've watched you for all your 19 years. Obviously, we we partnered together and worked together many times. I really appreciate the partnership so much. I think y'all get it. I think y'all are really good. There's not uh, don't 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 I don't say that lightly. I have a lot of respect for y'all. I 
knew that when I wanted y'all to be, in a sense, our first guest. And I said, because I, I just really believe uh, you're real. And I'm not insinuating about other people not being real, period, in the world. I'm just saying uh, we, we, we've always connected. We've always just had that sense that we got this, we can do this and everything. And I really appreciate that. So I admire you, look up to you. And uh, I think it's awesome how y'all have uh, been trying to work on trying to make sure that y'all can get through these challenging times of uh, with COVID and, and, and the live event industry and how y'all are doing. Y'all got to do stay alive. And, and sometimes that might be the only goal is just stay alive during right. this time. And, and uh, let's get through this together. But uh, I appreciate you talking to us. I appreciate everything that you've done for me and for PRI. I wish you the very best. We're Thank always you. here for you. And uh, again, if y'all, uh, if anyone listening, if you need some catering, you, you need to call uh, Liz and Jen. They're doing an amazing, wonderful job. And I think the biggest thing I would probably say if we wrap it up would probably be, it's just obvious y'all care. And that's awesome. You should never rent anything in Hungary. Really? So this is going to be sort of like our vegetables. Well, it's like bland vegetables in cold water. But uh, our summer rolls are going to be sort of be our vegetables. You're trying to retain the heat in the pasta. Okay. Got it. And hot water. Beyond the Bold is produced by PRI Productions, engineered by Alex Chapman, produced and edited by Leah Adams, Russell Pettibone, and Melissa Alexander. Our web and video team is Matt Oystatcher and Adam Madrid. To learn more about what we do, visit PRIproductions.com and make sure to come with us next time when we go Beyond the Bold.